Thank you for standing by and welcome to Autodesk third quarter and fiscal year 2025 financial results conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star one one on your telephone. To remove yourself from the queue, you may press star one one again. I would now like to hand the call over to Simon May Smith, VP, Invest Relations. Please go ahead. Thanks, Operator, and good afternoon. Thank you for joining our conference call to discuss the third quarter results of Autodesk Fiscal 25. On the line with me is Andrew Anagnost, our CEO, and Betsy Rafael, our interim CFO. During this call, we will make forward-looking statements, including outlook and related assumptions, and on product and strategies. Actual events or results could differ materially. Please refer to our SEC filings, including our most recent Form 10-Q and the Form 8-K filed with today's press release for important risks and other factors that may cause our actual results to differ from those in our forward-looking statements. Forward-looking statements made during the call are being made as of today. If this call is replayed or reviewed after today, the information presented during the call may not contain current or accurate information. Autodesk disclaims any obligation to update or revise any forward-looking statements. We will quote several numeric or growth changes during this call as we discuss our financial performance. Unless otherwise noted, each such reference represents a year-on-year comparison. All non-GAAP numbers referenced in today's call are reconciled in our press release or Excel financials and other supplemental materials available on our Investor Relations website. And now, I will turn the call over to Andrew. Thank you, Simon, and welcome everyone to the call. We finished the third quarter of the year strongly, delivering 12% revenue growth in constant currency and have again raised full-year guidance. This reflects the sustained momentum of the business and successful execution of our strategy, including a smooth implementation of the new transaction model in Western Europe. Once again, opportunity, resilience, and discipline underpinned our performance. Last month at Autodesk University in San Diego, we hosted 12,000 registered attendees and another 30,000 online. We showed how granular data in the cloud, organized in data models, and connected to everything through APIs can deliver even more valuable and connected solutions for customers and partners, and support a much broader ecosystem and marketplace. Customers and channel partners that I spoke with at AU remained cautiously optimistic, a sentiment consistent with the underlying momentum of our business our growing product usage, and building connected bid activity trends over recent quarters. I left AU with a tremendous sense of purpose and optimism in the ingenuity and persistence of our customers and for the future. On our earnings call last quarter, I set out our secular growth opportunities and our strategy to capitalize on them. I concluded that Autodesk's investment in cloud, platform, and AI in pursuit of those opportunities were ahead of its peers. AU was a good demonstration of that but we're also leading the industry in modernizing our go-to-market motion, starting a few years ago with the subscription transition through consumption and self-service enabling, and more recently to direct billing. These initiatives enable Autodesk to build larger and more durable direct relationships with its customers and to serve them more efficiently. We have already seen significant benefits from initiatives like these, and there's more to come in the next optimization phase. Taking out the effects on margins from FX and the new transaction model, we still expect to be towards the midpoint of our fiscal 26 non-GAAP operating margin target of 38 to 40% in fiscal 25, a year ahead of schedule. We are confident we will make further improvement in fiscal 26 on the same basis. The new transaction model will enable tighter channel partnerships with less duplication of effort and more digital self-service and automation which increases customer satisfaction and workforce productivity. It will also create new opportunities for partners and Autodesk to earn more, with less emphasis on transaction revenue sharing and a greater emphasis on value creation for customers. Once complete, we expect the new transaction model and subsequent go-to-market optimization to increase sales and marketing efficiency and deliver gap margins among the best in the industry. Attractive, long-term secular growth markets, a focused strategy delivering ever more valuable and connected solutions to our customers, and a resilient business are generating strong and sustained momentum, both in absolute terms and relative to peers. 
Disciplined execution and capital appointment is driven even greater operational velocity and efficiency within Autodesk and will underpin the mechanical build of revenue and free cash flow over the next few years and gap margins among the best in the industry. We will continue to deploy capital to offset and buy forward dilution as our free cash flow grows from the fiscal 24 trough. This practice has reduced our share count over the last three years. We have significantly increased our share repurchase authorization to extend this momentum flexibility over the medium term, with the precise trajectory remaining dependent on our debt repayment schedule and the ebb and flow of M&A. In combination, we believe these factors will deliver sustainable shareholder value over many years. Before I conclude, I'd like to formally welcome Janesh to Autodesk. We're excited to welcome Janesh, who brings a wealth of experience and will be instrumental in sustaining Autodesk growth and enhanced profitability momentum. Of equal importance, I'd like to thank Betsy for stepping in as interim CFO at an important time in the company's journey, and I'm looking forward to continuing to work closely with her as an Autodesk board member. I will now turn the call over to Betsy to discuss our quarterly financial performance and guidance for the year. I'll then return to provide an update on our strategic growth initiatives. Thanks, Andrew. Q3 was another strong quarter. We generated broad-based underlying growth across products and regions. In addition, we saw revenue increases from the new transaction model and M&A, which were offset by the absence of enterprise business agreement true-ups from Q3 last year and FX. Our make products continued to enhance growth, driven by our ongoing strength in construction and fusion. Overall, macroeconomic policy and geopolitical challenges and the underlying momentum of the business were consistent with the last few quarters, with continued strong renewal rates and headwinds to our new business growth. Total revenue grew 11% and 12% in constant currency. By product in constant currency, AutoCAD and AutoCAD LT revenue grew 8%. AEC revenue, which was most impacted by the absence of true up revenues, grew 12%. Manufacturing revenue grew 16%, and still comfortably in double digits, excluding upfront revenue. And M&E revenue grew 15%, boosted by the PIC acquisition and associated integration adjustments. By region and constant currency, Revenue grew 11% in the Americas, which was most impacted by the absence of true revenues, 13% in EMEA, and 14% in APAC. The mechanical contribution from the new transaction model to revenue was $17 million in the third quarter and $25 million on a year-to-date basis. Direct revenue increased 23%, and represented 42% of total revenue, up four percentage points from last year, benefiting from strong growth in both EBAs and the Autodesk store, and also the natural tailwind to revenue from the new transaction model. That revenue retention rate remained within the 100 to 110% range at constant exchange rates. Billings increased 28% in the quarter, reflecting a tailwind from the prior year's shift to annual billings for most multi-year contracts, early renewals, and the natural tailwind from the transition to the new transaction model. Similar to last quarter, and as expected, co-turning negatively impacted billings ahead of the launch of the new transaction model in Western Europe. The natural contribution from the new transaction model to billings was $72 million in the third quarter and $108 million on a year-to-date basis. Total deferred revenue decreased 9% to $3.7 billion and was again impacted by the transition from upfront to annual billings for multi-year contracts total RPO of $6.1 billion and current RPO of $4.0 billion grew 17% and 14% respectively, which reflects a tailwind from early renewals and the new transaction model and a headwind from the declining contribution of billed and unbilled deferred revenue from large multi-year and EBA cohorts 
ahead of renewal in fiscal 26. Excluding these, current RPO growth was broadly consistent with Q2. We do expect the new transaction model and the larger FY26 renewal cohorts to have a greater impact on both RPO and current RPO growth in Q4 of fiscal 25. Turning to margins, GAAP and non-GAAP gross margins were broadly level. With Autodesk University shifting back to Q3 this year from Q4 last year, GAAP and non-GAAP operating margins decreased by two and three percentage points respectively. The timing effect from AU obviously washes out over the full year. At current course and speed, the ratio of stock-based compensation as a percentage of revenue peaked in fiscal 24, will fall by more than a percentage point in fiscal 25, and will be below 10% over time. Free cash flow for the quarter was $199 million. This benefited from some channel partners in Western Europe booking business earlier in the quarter ahead of the transition to the new transaction model, really to de-risk month one after the transition. This accelerated free cash flow to the third quarter, which was partially offset by the expected negative impact of co-terming in Western Europe. Turning now to capital allocation, we continue to actively manage capital within our framework and deploy it with discipline and focus through the economic cycle to drive long-term shareholder value. As expected, the pace of buybacks picked up in the third quarter. We purchased approximately 1.2 million shares for $319 million at an average price of approximately $269 per share. We will continue to deploy capital to offset and buy forward dilution as our free cash flow grows from the fiscal 24 trough. This practice has reduced our share count by about 5 million shares over the last three years, with an average percentage reduction of about 70 basis points per year. We increased the amount authorized under our share repurchase program by $5 billion for a total of approximately $9 billion. This extends our flexibility over the medium term with the precise trajectory remaining dependent on our debt repayment schedule as well as the ebbs and flow of m and Now let me finish with guidance. As we said in February, the pace of the rollout of the new transaction model will create noise in billing and the p and So we think free cash flow is the best measure of our performance. Taking out that noise, the underlying momentum in the business remains consistent with the expectations embedded in our guidance range for the full year with continued strong renewal rates and headwinds to new business growth. Our sustained momentum in the third quarter and smooth launch of the new transaction model in Western Europe reduce the likelihood of our more cautious forecast scenarios. Given that, we're raising the midpoints of our billing revenue, margin, earning per share, and free cash flow guidance ranges. So let me give you a little bit more detail. The underlying momentum of billing is in line with our expectations. Compared to our modeling at the start of the year, the launch of the new transaction model in Western Europe in Q3 and early renewals have been a tailwind to billing. Whereas more co-terming more business done under the old buy-sell model before the launch of the new transaction model, and in recent weeks, FX movements have been headwinds to billing. We now estimate that the new transaction model will provide between a 5 and 5.5 percentage point tailwind to billings growth in fiscal 25. We've raised the midpoint of our fiscal 25 billings guidance by $10 million, to a range of 5.90 to 5.98 billion. The underlying momentum of revenue is also in line with our expectations. We estimate the new transaction model will provide around a one to one and a half percentage point tailwind to revenue growth in fiscal 25. Upfront revenue contributed two percentage points to revenue growth in Q4 of fiscal 24 
and therefore this is a headwind in Q4 of fiscal 25. While not large enough to call out at the start of the year, it was already factored into our Q4 and our full year model. We've raised the midpoint of our fiscal 25 revenue guidance range by $18 million to a range of $6.12 to $6.13 billion. We're increasing our GAAP and non-GAAP margin guidance midpoint by 25 basis points by raising the bottom end of the ranges by 50 basis points. The gap margin guidance range is now 21.5 to 22%. The non-gap margin guidance range is now 35.5 to 36%, which includes a 1 to 1.5 percentage point underlying margin improvement, broadly offset by the margin headwinds from the new transaction model and the related incremental investment in people, processes, and automation. The underlying momentum of free cash flow is also in line with our expectations. The headwinds of billings from co-turning and FX rates that I mentioned earlier is being offset by early renewals, faster collection, and improved underlying margins. We raised the midpoint of our fiscal 25 free cash flow guidance by 10 million and tightened the range to 1.47 to 1.5 billion. We expect strong free cash flow growth in fiscal 26 because of the return of our largest multi-year renewal cohort, the natural mechanical stacking of multi-year contracts built annually, and a larger EBA cohort. With our current trajectory, we still estimate free cash flow in fiscal 26 to be around $2.05 billion at the midpoint. The slide deck on our website has more details on modeling assumptions for Q3 and for the full fiscal year 25. And while this may be my last earnings call for Autodesk, I will stick around for a bit to ensure a smooth transition for Janesh. Thank you, Andrew, and everyone at Autodesk for your support while I was here, and to the many investors and analysts with whom I've had lively discussions over the last few quarters. While the transition to annual billings for multi-year contracts and the deployment of the new transaction model has created noise and billings in the P&L, they do provide a natural near-term tailwind to revenue and free cash flow growth. Combined with a resilient business model, sustained competitive momentum, Autodesk has enviable sources of visibility and certainty in a very uncertain world. For all these reasons, I step down from my role as interim CFO with tremendous optimism for the future. Andrew, back to you. Thank you, Betsy. Let me finish by updating you on our strong progress in the third quarter. We continue to see good momentum in AEC, particularly in infrastructure and construction, fueled by customers consolidating onto our solutions to connect and optimize previously siloed workflows through the cloud. The cornerstone of that growing interest is our comprehensive end-to-end solutions encompassing design, pre-construction, field execution, through handover and into operations. This breadth of connected capability enables us to extend our footprint further into infrastructure and construction and also expand our reach into the mid-market. As a sign of our growing momentum as the benefits of our end-to-end solution become more apparent, our construction business continues to perform robustly, with net new customers doubling year over year and existing customers' renewal and expansion rates remaining strong. Let me give you a few examples. Power construction is number 79 on the engineering news record, ENR, top 400 U.S. contractor list. It is a Chicago-based general contractor serving residential and non-residential end markets. After completing a competitive RFP to replace its legacy project management tool, Power selected Autodesk for its unified construction platform across pre-construction, construction, and VDC. By standardizing on Autodesk Construction Cloud, Power will have a single source of truth for project data, enhanced collaboration capabilities, and streamlined workflows on a single platform. Power Construction was one of two ENR 400 top 100 U.S. contractors that standardized enterprise-wide on Autodesk build during the quarter. In Europe, Bouygues, a top 10 ENR 250 international contractor based in France and leader in sustainable building and infrastructure projects, renewed and expanded its EBA in the quarter. 
WEEG is continuing to consolidate on Autodesk solutions across the enterprise, including broader adoption of Autodesk Forma, Carbon Insight, and Informed Design to digitize, decarbonize, and industrialize projects. It also significantly increases commitment to Autodesk Construction Cloud to drive efficiency gains and faster bid response times through better collaboration between design and project teams. Subana Durang is number 23 on ENR's top 225 international design firms. Based in Singapore, it is an urban infrastructure and integrated solutions consulting firm. In Q3, it renewed its third EBA, which included increased investment in Autodesk Construction Cloud and Autodesk Water Infrastructure Solutions. ACC is helping to scale its operations through increased automation, integrated design workflows, and enhanced collaboration across time zones. Our water infrastructure solutions will be a core technology supporting its growth ambitions in planning, designing, engineering, and managing water projects for customers worldwide. Again, these stories have a common theme, managing people, processes, and data across the project life cycle to increase efficiency and sustainability while decreasing risk. Over time, we expect the majority of all projects to be managed this way, and we remain focused on enabling that transition through our industry clouds. Moving on to manufacturing, we made excellent progress on our strategic initiatives. Customers continue to invest in their digital transformation and consolidate on our design and make platform. Fusion remains one of the fastest growing products in the manufacturing industry. As customers seek to drive innovation and growth at lower cost, Fusion extension attach rates are increasing, which is helping to drive the average sales price higher. For example, in the quarter, a global manufacturer supplying the semiconductor industry selected Fusion Manage and Vault PLM over competitive solutions to foster greater collaboration across manufacturing sites and improve operating efficiency. Once fully scaled and operational, this customer expects to save 105,000 hours per year by connecting people and data, resulting in reduced product development costs and faster time to market. In the UK, Playdale Playground has been designing, manufacturing, and installing outdoor playground equipment for over 40 years. This quarter, Playdale added Fusion to its existing portfolio of Autodesk solutions, including Inventor, AutoCAD, and Vault, to streamline and digitize workflows, optimize production to reduce lead times, reduce nonconformities, and replace inefficient Excel-driven operations on the shop floor. A longtime Autodesk customer and global leader in precision engineering solutions renewed and expanded its EBA in the quarter. In addition to Inventor, Vault, and AutoCAD, it is adopting Fusion's generative design capabilities for material waste reduction and fluid flow optimization and mold flow to reduce manufacturing costs and defects while increasing mold yields. In education, universities continue to modernize their courses and curriculum to attract and prepare future engineers. For example, from this winter, Students at the University of Stuttgart Institute for Medical Device Technology will use Fusion across six courses. Fusion was selected to replace a competitive solution for its modern platform, ease of use, cloud collaboration capabilities, and unique combination of PCB and additive manufacturing workflows in a single team environment. And lastly, we continue to work with our customers to ensure they are using the latest and most secure versions of our software. For example, after a period of rapid scaling and diversification, a large multinational manufacturing company in APAC was looking to align compliance rates across its global employee base. Working collaboratively, we addressed compliance issues while cementing a long-term partnership and completing one of our largest ever licensed compliance agreements, which included expanded adoption of ALIAS and VRED for the design studio, and PDMC for mechanical engineering and rail design. Attractive long-term secular growth markets, a focused strategy delivering ever more valuable and connected solutions to our customers, and a resilient business are generating strong and sustained momentum both in absolute terms and relative to peers. Disciplined execution and capital deployment is driving even greater operational velocity and efficiency within Autodesk, and we continue to deploy capital to deliver sustainable shareholder value over many years. I retain a tremendous sense of purpose and optimism in the ingenuity and persistence of our customers and for the future. Operator, we would now like to open the call up for questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1-1 on your telephone. To remove yourself from the queue, you may press star 1-1 again. 
Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Jason Salino of KeyBank Capital Markets. Your question, please, Jason. Hey, thanks for taking my questions. Just two from me. Um, you know, the first one, uh, Andrew, you know, some of us are, are unfamiliar with Janesh. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about him and, and what he brings to Autodesk? I certainly can. Uh, before I do that, let me make sure that I thank Betsy for everything she brought to Autodesk during this interim period. I really appreciate it. The company appreciates it. Thank you, Betsy. Now, we're really excited about Janesh. And let me tell you why we're excited about Janesh. As you remember, one of the things I was telling you that I was looking for was someone that was going to be able to dispassionately drive optimization at scale inside of Autodesk. And, and what that really means is someone that's going to be really inwardly focused, looking at every dollar that we invest and making sure that we're getting the most return for the business, and that investors are getting the best return from their business. The next kind of criteria we were looking for, which was a nice to have, was you know time in the seat as a, as a sitting CFO, which was, which was important for us as well. But it was kind of the next nice to have after the optimization at scale. Janesh brings a great balance of both of those things. All right, he's been in the seat seven years at Elastic, uh, both CFO and COO, driving some fairly turbulent changes inside of Elastic. So he's got, he's got battle scars from pushing inside the company to get changes done inside, and we like that. We like that a lot. He's also got um, very good early experience at companies that we feel have always added value to Autodesk. So he was at VMware in a senior position. He was at Cisco in a senior position. We've had good success bringing people from those kind of companies. He worked at those companies driving optimization at scale, which is the number one criteria I was looking for when we were driving this work. He also has another nice to have. He's got knowledge of our industry. He, he spent two years at PTC earlier in his career. He was actually recently on the, on the PTC board. So he understands our industry, and he'll be able to get up to speed pretty quickly. The number one goal here, drive optimization at scale over the next few years, make sure that we're getting everything we, we need from every dollar we invest, which is a very important theme for Autodesk. Uh, and, you know, with, with that, I, uh, I'm really excited, and I'm, I'm looking forward to him joining in December. Okay, great. Interesting. Um, and then for my second question, now that you do have a CFO, uh, do you have any thoughts on when you might hold the next investor day? I think in the past you usually did it in March. You know, is that a good time frame or is that too soon? Thanks. Yeah, well, Janesh is joining in December. I think, I think we need to give him time to get his, his sea legs on, uh, give him time to kind of, you know, drive the, the end of the year and actually uh, get us set up for, for next fiscal year in, in good steed. So I would say it's unlikely we'll be doing anything in the spring, but we'll get back to you with, on that as soon as, you know, Jeff Janesh is ready to talk about those things. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Jay Blishauer of Griffin Securities. Your question, please, Jay. Uh, thank you. Um, Andrew, as of the, uh, the third quarter, uh, your three-year CAGR for current RPO is about 12%. Um, how are you thinking about the sustainability or perhaps improvement upon that CAGR for CRPO um, over the next number of years? Um, when we think about the ingredients of that, it looks like over the last several years, the CAGR for your unit volume for, for all, all brands is roughly 6 to 7% uh, in the aggregate. So on top of that, you've had price and, uh, and other ingredients. But perhaps talk about how you think you might be able to improve upon the, um, uh, the most recent uh, trajectory for current RPO. That might follow up. Uh, yeah, hi, Jay. This is Betsy. Let me just give you uh, a couple things. I, I, there, there's a number of things that are going on under the headline of the CRPO number. You know, if you first take away the headwinds and the tailwinds, C CRPO was broadly consistent with the second quarter. And as I mentioned in my opening commentary, early renewals and growth with, um, and the, the new transaction model are providing a tailwind. And then there's also a headwind to CRPO growth from the declining contribution of build and unbilled deferred revenue from the large multi-year EBA cohort coming up for renewal in fiscal 26. 
And just as a reminder, these are the same larger cohorts we are calling out as tailwinds to free cash flow for next year. Um, and if you look back to fiscal 22, we saw this same dynamic ahead of the fiscal 23 renewals as well. Okay. Um, since new management is, uh, is part of the news this evening, could you talk about uh, how you're thinking about uh, the cur uh, chief revenue officer position? Um, would it make sense perhaps to continue to have a separate CRO, or do you think uh, it might make more sense perhaps to combine CRO and COO? Yeah, so we're, we're going to continue to have a separate CRO because we, we have various functions that work together there under the COO organization, including, you know, our IT organization, all our infrastructure, and all things associated with this. What we're, what we're looking for in, in our CRO is someone that understands how to continue to drive a business when you have direct engagement with the customer. So that means someone that really understands what it takes to uh, analyze self-service patterns, actually understand the data that comes in from the customers to help drive cross-sell and upsell, while also transforming a channel from a transactionally focused you know, extension of Autodesk to kind of a solutions partner that's driving life cycle solutions for our customers. So that's the kind of role we're looking for here. And yeah, it's going to continue to be a standalone CRO role within the CRO organization. Thank you very much. Comes from the line of Adam Borg of Stiefel. Your line is open, Adam. Awesome. Thanks so much for taking the questions, and congrats to, to Betsy and Janesh. Um, maybe on, on the new uh, transaction model, uh, I know it's still early, but I was just curious, are there any learnings uh, from those customers that are on the new model that you're seeing in terms of the adoption of Autodesk technology uh, and the ability to find white space to better upsell and cross-sell different solutions now that you have a more direct relationship? Yeah, Adam, it's really early on to be able to make any kind of conclusions about that. What, what, I, what, I, what I can tell you is that we definitely see uh, some shift to some of the direct channels at Autodesk for customers that were probably just, you know, served on a, on a very kind of, you know, uh, arm's length kind of transactional level. But in terms of driving cross-sell and upsell, early days, early days. But, you know, if, if you want to get a sense for how that might evolve, you know, we've got experience with our EBAs and our enterprise business agreements, and we've learned over the years that having that kind of relationship with the customer where we really understand their usage patterns, who they are and what they're doing, we are much more effective at driving cross-sell and upsell, even, even when partnering with our channel partners. So, you know, I, I think those kind of stand as a testament of what's possible as we move forward with, the, with completion of the new transaction model. Great. And maybe just as a quick follow-up, uh, just as we think about the new administration coming in, you talked about uh, the macro being broadly consistent. Any change in tone or in your conversations with the end markets in terms of optimism or their ability or willingness to expand new projects ahead of the administration? Any pause or just full steam ahead? I'm just curious. Any commentary you have there from a macro perspective uh, would be really, really helpful. Thanks so much. You know, what I'll say is the things that matter to our customers are bipartisan things. All right. Uh, our, our customers care about infrastructure build-outs. Uh, uh, both parties care about infrastructure build-outs. Our, our, our customers care about domestic manufacturing, be it in Europe, be it in the Uni United States. Uh, both parties agree that the domestic manufacturing build-outs are important. Uh, it, it, supply chain independence, supply chain stability, all of these things are bipartisan issues that really affect our customers. So, Regardless of the administration, I suspect the things that are important to our customers are continuing to be, to be a focus. Thanks again. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Joe Runk of Baird. Please go ahead, Joe. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, on the outlook for next year, $2.050 billion in free cash has, I think, been the expectation for the past year now. Uh, within the last year, you've also seen more co-term of contracts, and I think that leads to better billings in FY26. So my question is, does that actually create the potential that things are better, and that's why you're qualifying now the 2.050 as the midpoint of possibilities. 
it, it's, it, there's no change to how we talked about the um, the free cash flow guide for for fiscal 26. It continues to be 2.05 billion as a new Okay, um, fair enough. And then uh, just on the uh, M&A environment, over recent history, Autodesk has been more in a mode of, uh, I would say, strategic tuck-ins. I think there was actually an asset in the CFE simulation space that was announced during uh, AU in the quarter. Is that the right approach for Autodesk, just given this point in time, all the work you've done to build out the cloud platform, the data model, and so these tuck-ins make the most sense? And if that's true, how would you maybe compare and contrast uh, some of the larger scale M&A that's happening with your peers in the space? Yeah, so look, you know, consolidation in our space is inevitable. I'm not going to comment on any specific deal, but here's what, here's what I'll say. Autodesk has always been an acquisitive company, and we will be a acquisitive company when that makes both strategic and financial sense for the company. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Elizabeth Porter of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead, Elizabeth. Great. Thanks so much for the question. As partners are getting uh, customers just up and running on the new transaction model, we picked up that they're spending a little bit more time than usual uh, of time and resources with those existing customers. So I was curious if that had any impact on new business demand kind of more recently. And then just more broadly, any change in new business trends that, that you think you should call out from versus last quarter? Yeah, hi Elizabeth, it's Betsy. And so just broadly speaking, you know, we continue continue to see growth but at a slower pace due to a number of factors over the really over the last several years, macro, COVID, exiting Russia, um, elections. And and while a drag on the forward momentum of the business, all of that's really factored into, you know, into our guidance. Um, so I, I kind of just would leave it at that. Great. And then a follow-up just on billings, understanding there's a lot of volatility around the change from multi-year and the transaction model, but it looks like guidance implies a bigger step down in growth in Q4, just despite an easier year ago compare. So it's helped when you could help us unpack the balance of those headwinds and tailwinds that would drive kind of a greater downtick in growth in Q4. Um, well, again, let, let me start out with just from a fiscal 25 perspective, your um, billing tailwinds are going to be from the final shift to annual billing, the new transaction model, and early renewals. And you're going to get headwinds from co-terming and business booked ahead of the new um, transaction model launch, and in recent weeks, some, some FX. So, um, again, I think that uh, we've continued to perform well um, as we've executed through uh, through Q3, and so um, I think we feel very very strongly about our expectations for Q4. Great, thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Bobin Shah of Deutsche Bank. Your question, please, Bobin. Great, thanks for taking my question if you got some quarter. Andrew, at university there to be appeared to be a noticeable uptick in, in attendance and sessions geared towards owners and operators. Now, what's been driving the recent interest from this segment? How much of it is product uh, enhancements you guys have made versus really more focusing and emphasizing from a go to market perspective? And how long before this segment of buyers kind of becomes more meaningful to the financials? Yeah, well, that's an excellent question, all right? Uh, we're very interested in, in ta tackling the whole entire life cycle from design through make, construction, manufacturing, all the way to, into operations. You're probably aware we have a product called Tandem, and a lot of those sessions were driven by increasing interest and increasing adoption of Tandem, which is a digital twin solution, a solution tightly coupled to our, our solutions that, that also has a toolkit that allows people to easily connect sensor data to, to the digital twin solution. So you, you're, you're seeing that uptick because we're directly releasing products and capabilities that are of interest to the owner's space. Uh, you can expect to see that trend continue 
uh, over time, and you can expect to see us continue to talk about the owner space, continue to deliver solutions for the owner space, and even APIs for the owner space. It's, it's an area of great interest, especially when it comes not only to vertical buildings, but factories and other things that are related to that, as well as infrastructure, like what we were doing with some of our water owner solutions. So yes, owners matter. We're building software for them, and you're going to see more of that. Super helpful there. And, and then, Betsy, one for you. Just in terms of the underlying improvement that we've been seeing in the margins, and I know you've called out FX and the transaction model. I know it's very early, but as we think about next year, how do we think about the, the, the impact of FX and the transaction model to kind of the, the headline operating margins? Well, you know, I wish I could give you that answer, but I think that the new CFO would probably have a little bit of a problem with that. So uh, we'll, we'll wait till the end of February to give you more specifics on that. Fair enough. Thanks for taking my questions. Good try. <laughs> Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Tyler Radke of City. Please go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the questions. Uh, I was going to ask you about uh, a placeholder for, for next year's guidance, uh, Betsy, but I'll, I'll, uh, I don't want to waste a question on that, but feel free to answer. Um, but, uh, Andrew, I, I wanted to kind of ask you um, about some of the, your, your comments you made uh, around efficiency, especially as it relates to, to hiring uh, Janesh, who, who you pointed out has a lot of experience at, at you know larger companies, VMware, Cisco, et cetera. Um, now that you're a few quarters into this transaction model rollout, you, you have kind of visibility uh, better on on some of the you know channel um, uh, prior channel relationships, having that direct billing with the customer. What are what are some of the areas? That you've identified um, as, uh, as as having that efficiency potential, and then as we think about that efficiency unlock, should we think about that as incremental uh, to the the free cash flow uh, number you have out for for next year, or, or is that uh, embedded in that already? Thank you. So many so many layers to that question. <laughs> All right. So so first, let me let me kind of answer the question in a serious stage, and then dodge other ones. Okay. So you know, f first off, you know, optimization is kind of a mindset at Autodesk. It's not something that 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 suddenly happens. I I, I want to reemphasize that because if you look right now this year, for for example. When you look at the apples apples comparison, which will be you know in the, the slide decks or in our disclosed materials, you, you can see that our non gap margins are already hitting the targets we set for next year this year. Okay, so optimization is a mentality. You've also heard me say over and over again as the new transaction model starts to roll out, optimization of our, our go to market efforts is going to be a, a critical step for us and part of the optimization journey that we're on that's going to deliver a margin growth for the company for for a couple of years to come, okay? And I think that's important. It's, it's a long-term driver. Now, with getting into the specifics, okay, I, I think the specifics are probably for another time, but let me just kind of give you a sense for some of the things that are, that are important, all right? One is the, the drive to self-service, all right? Self-service is a huge impact on how our customers will engage with us and, and where those customers come from, and, and that is a, a value accretive to Autodesk both on an efficiency side from renewals and other things, but also on a, on a revenue growth side through, through, other, uh, through capturing the customers directly. The other thing I talked about uh, is understanding the customer better, so the upsell and cross-sell. So we're going to be able to do a lot more automation and understanding about what, where the opportunities are, and that's going to drive some efficiencies. And we're moving the channel partners away from this, this model of being the transactional players to being the solution providers and the IP providers to our customers. That's going to have all sorts of opportunities to eliminate duplication of effort and drive real cost efficiencies for the company moving forward. So there's, there's both top-line efficiencies here and revenue growth, but there's bottom-line uh, efficiencies as well through, through uh, re removing the redundancies and steps that just aren't necessary for the customer. You'll get a lot more clarity on that as you see us continue to move forward with this go-to-market optimization in the next year and beyond that. Great. Thank, thanks for the detail. <clears throat> and then my follow-up question, uh, Andrew, you talked about some really strong um, net new customer additions within uh, the, the construction cloud, um, I think doubling year over year. 
uh, we also saw the make revenue uh, accelerate to, to 28% um, constant currency. Can you just help us understand, do you think that, that reacceleration is, is durable and um, how are you sort of thinking about uh, just your, your position there, what, what's been driving uh, that strength in, in the new customer additions? So first, first, let me uh, comment on the make revenue, then I'm going to go into construction. So the make revenue also includes some revenue from picks and things associated with that. However, let's talk about the facts around our construction business, because I think this is important. Right? Number one, number one factor is that we continue to d- d- drive consistent high growth in our construction solutions. You're seeing it, it's built into the, it's built into the make numbers and it's the, it's the lion's share of those make numbers. It, we're really, you're really seeing some consistent growth there. That's inorganic. That's organically. Inorganically, we're actually executing incredibly well on things like pay apps, and that's driving acceleration of our growth. So we are not decelerating as a business. Okay, we are we are actually performing solidly, or, in, or, or inorganically, we're accelerating. All right, and uh, and I just want to be really clear about that. And yes, we said year over year we drove a two x increase in our new customers, and I'll talk about where some of that's that's coming from in, in just a minute. But I also want to highlight. The other thing that's going on, we are strengthening an already strong position in the ENR 400. So you heard about the story about power construction, which was a great example of someone taking out a competitive RFP and saying, look, I need a forward-looking cloud-based solution on new technology that goes end-to-end from design to construction all the way to operations, and they chose us. And that was just one example that we gave in the opening commentary. So already a strengthening uh, position in the ENR 400. Now, th- the other qualitative things that are driving some of that new customer growth is we, we already have our distribution channel operating at scale. In the U.S., this is helping us go down market more effectively, which is allowing us to capture more customers more effectively, be places where we weren't before and where others aren't, which is part of the driving that. But also, we're already at scale operating internationally. With our, with our distribution channel. So that's driving international growth for us. And that's, that's a really important driver as well as some of those net new accounts that you're seeing there. And the last thing I'll add, and then, then I'm done with construction, is that, look, this, I heard this over and over again at AU. I'm hearing it over and over again from customers in lots of different places. They want the end-to-end solution. They want the life solution in the cloud. They're placing bets for the next 10 years. They want to go from design to construction to operations, and that's just making our solution more attractive to the market. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Michael Turin of Wells Fargo. Your question, please, Michael. Hey, thanks very much. appreciate you taking the questions. Um, the commentary on the call sounded consistent, but wondering if there are any added details you can provide for us on um, just the overall macro spend environment and how that's maybe progressing across either key product segments or geos, whatever split you think is more useful. I think what we're trying to get a sense for is if there are any shades of improvement anywhere or if you characterize as mainly just consistent uh, over the past couple of quarters. Thanks. Yeah, Michael, I, I think the core answer here is consistency, okay? We're, we're seeing consistent trends that we've seen with all, in, in all the other quarters. There's always puts and takes in a large business, business like ours, especially one as diverse as ours. But the general tone is it's consistent with prior quarters. And I would just add that there's also been a lot of noise this year from the new transaction model and then obviously the elections and leading up to that. And so it's hard to sparse out um, kind of that, that particular behavior. So I think, as Andrew said, we, we call it consistent. Yeah, tough for us, too. That's why we keep asking. Um, Betsy, congrats on the, the transition back. I mean, you're also on the board. I think it would be useful to hear you chime in on um, the hiring of Janesh and maybe just also comment on how you ensure you're able to hand over the reins and, and keep progress going on the key transitions the company's working through. Thanks. Well, per se, um, I was involved in the, in the process, which was um, quite extensive in, in the company and the recruiting of Janesh. Um, and so we're certainly very excited to have him on board. What I would also say um, is obviously with my experience of being on the board for 11 years as well as my deep dive into the business over the last six months, one of the reasons I'm staying around until the end of the fiscal year um, is I think I can be really helpful in that transition for Janesh. Um, and so I'm very much looking forward. And, and 
you know, I think that we have a great finance team, and I think that that he's um, he's going to be he's going to fit very well, and I'm looking forward to um, making that happen as fast as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Matthew Hedberg of RBC Capital Markets. Your question, please, Matthew. Hey, guys, this is uh, Mike Richards. I'm from Matt. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, I was wondering if you could provide an update on Project Bernini and, and maybe how customer reception has been and where we are in developing other foundational models or just the monetization opportunity there. Thanks. Yeah, so so first off, first off, before I comment on Bernino, AI is you might have heard from A A U. AI is embedded embedded in everything we're doing from a bottom up and a top down perspective. And you also heard us talk at AU about new types of foundation models we're building that understand how certain things are done in our applications. You, uh, you heard about a foundation model that's driving automated drawing creation. You heard about a, a foundation model that's driving automated sketch generation uh, and sketch constraints. That's, that kind of stuff is bottom-up innovation. Berdini is more of a top-down type uh, innovation where you're, you're actually specifying things and trying to generate a preliminary outcome from those specifications. And what, what we've been doing with, with Bernini is we've been trying to engage with certain targeted customers to get them to participate with us in making Bernini smarter and more intelligent. It's not available commercially right now, but it's, it's getting more intelligent. We've actually been successful in getting some customers to stand up and say, look, yeah, I'd like to work with you to make this more intelligent because we need something that actually understands 3D, 3D geometry as geometry, not just as a picture of something, okay? So that's what's going on with Bernini right now, and, I, and you should continue to see refinements and, and uh, extensions of that moving forward. Now, with, with regard to monetization, you know, monetizations, you know, nobody knows exactly how all this is going to be monetized, but, you know, there's, there's a few vectors here that, that, that come into play. One. We are ahead of our, our competitors in this space. We intend to be ahead. We're investing to stay ahead. Uh, that increases one's competitive position in the marketplace, and that's really important. Also, you get to be able to charge for some of these incremental features in the future. When, you, when you're delivering value or a, or a high-quality outcome as a result, you're, you're going to charge for that outcome. How we charge for those things, let's, let's let this play out, okay? It's still early days. But you also, you, there's also monetization opportunities through licensing certain technologies for specific uh, mature maturation for a specific customer's needs, all right? And that will be another avenue. So how these avenues play out, which one waits more, let's let this play out. But the, what, you, what you need to know about Autodesk is we're ahead. We've been ahead for a while. We were the first out, out there with an AI research lab that's been out there for over six years. It's published 70 papers. We're, we're right on the cutting edge of 3D design technology and AI, and we intend to stay there. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Steve Tusa of J.P. Morgan. Your question, please, Steve. Uh, hey, uh, good, e good evening or afternoon. Um, uh, lots of uh, good questions asked. Just, uh, just a detailed one. Um, wh what's the change in the billings contribution uh, from the uh, you know transaction model change? The the, the five to six, the five to five and a half. Oh, I know that's what. They, sorry. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically because we did more um, uh, buy sell business ahead of the European launch. It's yeah. a short. It's a short. Answer. So remember, we said five to six percent when we launched Europe, um, and it was the it, we did more buy sell business, which means there's less tailwind uh, from the new transaction model. The flip side mean that that means that the underlying increase in our bidding guidance is greater than it looks on a headline basis. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Joshua Tilton of Wolf Research. Your line is open, Joshua. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, great. I have a, a kind of a high-level one on the incoming CFO. Um, if, I, if I heard correctly, we didn't exactly get like an initial outlook for uh, revenue growth for next year. 
And I'm just trying to understand in the context of the new CFO coming in, is there anything that could change the calculus of how you guys think about that 10 to 15% growth, uh, you know, for the underlying business outside of the agency transition that's ongoing today? Well, first, let's talk about that framework a little bit, and uh, and then I'll, I'll comment a little bit on, on the increase of CFO. So, look, um, the, the 10 to 15 percent growth, right now we're, we're pretty much right at the bottom end of that range. And, you know, if we look back over the last two years, there's been a series of things that created headwinds to, to new business. It started off with things like the pandemic, if they, the inflation, the exiting of the Russian business, the writer's strike, uh, the whole... Uh, trade wars within particular geographies. All of these things were accumulated headwinds that built slowly into the business and have pushed us down to the low end of the range. It takes time in a subscription model for those things to build out of the business, okay? So it's going to take time for us to build out of that. That's to be expected with a subscription model. The revenue goes down slowly. It goes back up slowly as, 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 as headwinds turn into tailwinds. So expect us to be near the bottom of that range in the short term, just as a, a, a general kind of guideline for the, for the core business to be at the bottom of the range, okay? Uh, as a long-term framework, the, the, the 10 to 15 still makes sense as a long-term guide for the company. But of course, you know, as new eyes come in, we'll, we'll look at these things and we'll evaluate them. But right now, this all still makes sense. Super helpful, thank you. Thank you. Our next question. Comes on the line of CT Panagrahi of Mizuho. Your question, please, CT. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I understand the new business model of some kind of noise in the, you know, your expense and, and margin side. But if you uh, exclude that, what do you see some of the operating leverages that you can drive in, uh, you know, next year or so? Well, I think we've actually provided you know, kind of historically yeah. what we've done over the last three years pretty clearly, yeah. and I think we said that you know we're continued to be focused on um, expansion, but nothing further to add as far as next year. We did provide data on okay. that, so you can see so you can see what the underlying thing is, and we and we we expect to see continued improvement in, in that same vector on the same basis on the same on the same basis on the same apples to apples basis. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Our next question Oops. comes from the line of Michael Funk of Bank of America. Your question, please, Michael. Yeah, guys, thank you for the question tonight. Um, to, to if I could, you've mentioned a few times in the last calls about the largest multi-year cohort renewing next year and also a large EBA cohort. Um, just wondering if you can give us um, kind, of, kind of the range of potential outcomes among the renewals there, whether, you know, potential to upsell, um, risk of downsell, and what that variance might look like around those renewals. No, I mean, I think what, what we have said is that it's the largest cohort, you know, that, and we saw that um, performance in, in 23, and so we expect, a, a, you know, a, a strong renewal year, but we're not giving any specific guidance on what that looks like for 26 at this point, and we'll wait until we um, uh, report earnings in February. Okay, great. And then, Betsy, one more. You know, you've mentioned a few times off the investment in new transaction model, people, processes, and automation, you know, presumably more fixed cost versus variable like commission. Um, can you quantify that for us to help us with modeling? as we try to forecast margin, not even if you have its guidance, but better understanding of what that cost might actually be on an absolute basis would help us to think about our modeling. Mike, we've got, we've got a slide in the earnings deck to help you think about modeling, um, and I'll just point you to that. Okay, great. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time we have for Q&A today. I would now like to turn the conference back to Simon May Smith for closing remarks. Sir? Great. Thanks, Latif. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, looking forward to seeing many of you on the road over the next few weeks. Um, if you have any questions in the meantime, please just email me or call me. And in the meantime, all those of you in North America, wishing you a very happy Thanksgiving. Thanks, Latif. 
Thank you, Simon. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect. Goodbye.